broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, this is Brian Cox from the Bioenergy Association. I'd like to welcome you all today to this webinar. Uh, this is a uh, webinar that is part of our series of information uh, dissemination that we provide throughout the year. Uh, we try to have uh, one webinar at least once a month. And uh, the aim of uh, these webinars is to ensure that uh, uh, not only information is, is to, uh, shared, but that the connections are made. So we welcome your participation in the webinar. Uh, the more discussion we have, then uh, the, the better the webinar is. We don't want to have it just as a talking head with Marcus just talking and then everyone going away. Um, the issue is to be able to find out what it is that uh, you most want to know, and so we can discuss that. So in this webinar, uh, Marcus will talk um, and give a brief presentation, and then we'll throw it open to questions. The format for questions is that you put your hand up, you will find there's a button up on the side of your screen um, where, where you can put your hand up, and I will see that uh, you uh, are uh, wanting to speak and can invite you to do that. The alternative is you can write a question and I will do it. But my preference is for people to question. So I'm Brian Cox, the Bioenergy Association Executive Officer. And part of my role is to identify where there is a lot of interest in information, find people who can um, have that information and share it with us, and then uh, provide a format for it to go out. This may be in terms of written formats, in terms of newsletter or in webinars. And so we're responding to what we see as the market uh, need for information at any time. With the activities in the small scale uh, activities for biomass uh, energy uh, increasing at quite a, a fast rate, principally through um, government, uh, the government procurement program is sort of taking a, a focus on uh, government facilities, um, particularly in the Ministry of Education uh, with uh, schools, is that we are finding that we're getting a lot of questions uh, about the use of biomass heating and uh, that uh, linkages to uh, the right people, uh, but also uh, just getting some of the basic questions uh, about the appropriateness of it. So I've asked uh, Marcus uh, Baker to uh, speak today. Marcus is from Apicus New Zealand. Uh, Apicus New Zealand uh, cover uh, a number of technologies, not only uh, wood pellet heating, uh, but they cover solar and heat pumps. So Marcus has a good all round uh, understanding of when a biomass solution is an appropriate solution. Uh, sometimes it's not always appropriate, but uh, generally it can be. If it's done right, um, if it's looked at and analysed right and uh, and set up correctly. The biomass solution could be with pellets or chips. Uh, Marcus's background at the moment is in, in pellets, so with this uh, presentation will be on a pellet uh, fuel, but uh, uh, the similar thing can be done uh, for uh, using other forms of, uh, of biomass chip uh, or hog fuel. So the aspect about these uh, type of applications, uh, whether they are schools, whether they are small commercial applications or accommodation institutions, is that there are a number of common threads that uh, are important for people who are looking at this opportunity and comparing this with other uh, solutions to have a good understanding um, of what the strengths are of uh, using a uh, solution. Uh, compared to what they're doing with the other uh, forms of, of heating that they may be looking at. So I've asked Marcus to focus this on schools um, because that's uh, one where a number of schools are putting out tenders at the moment. And uh, so we want to make sure that that particular market is well informed. Um, and uh, uh, the commercial aspects uh, he is covering, and particularly in an in Institute of Professional Engineers uh, webinar um, that uh, is coming up, and uh, but we will be looking some more at that later on. If you have um, questions uh, that uh, you would like us to explore in more depth on other webinars, I'd love to hear from you, uh, because we want to be able to respond to what 
it is that uh, people need information on, not uh, just uh, selling information for selling information's sake. The webinar is uh, free to attend, and uh, at this uh, um, uh, event, we've had a, re a record 122 registrations. Uh, so there is obviously a great uh, degree of interest in this topic. The uh, event is, uh, the webinar is put on free because ECA provides us some a small amount of funding uh, to put these events on and and uh, cover our costs. Um, the aspect though is that the stronger and the more we can do is if we have a good membership. Uh, so if you are interested in this topic, uh, particularly as a business, uh, or in terms of putting a bit of, uh, quite a bit of effort into the, uh, the biomass energy solutions, um, I'd love to hear from you with regard to membership. We need a good, strong organisation. We need to be able to uh, advocate uh, and give, provide good information, um, and that costs money. And uh, we are a small organisation, uh, so we do need strong membership. Anyway, uh, to move on to this webinar, um, Marcus has titled 100% Renewable, Reliable, Low Maintenance School Heating System with Wood Pellet Boilers. So I'll pass this over to you now, Marcus, to uh, expand on introducing yourself uh, and then um, give us a short presentation before we take questions. Over to you, Marcus. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> Pardon me. Kia ora koutou. So just a little bit about Apricus New Zealand to start with. We're specialists in renewable central heating and hot water systems, so just to know where we're coming from, and we're the New Zealand distributors and system designers for the Erkefen um, commercial wood pellet boilers, Pelomatics, the, the main range that we bring into this country, they've got quite a large range of different boilers, um, Easy Pell domestic scale boilers, Apricus evacuated tube solar hot water systems, and the reclaim energy CO2 hot water heat pumps. So we try and cover the really the broad spread of different technologies that are available for water heating and then central heating using water distribution. So if we just jump in to what's happening at the moment, we are seeing some significant climate in crisis um, yeah, outcomes. And this is a picture of Gore in February. And the latest understanding um, and the subsequent declaration from 11,000 scientists in the Bioscience Journal of last November was that the climate crisis has arrived, accelerating faster than scientists expected, more severe than anticipated, threatening natural ecosystems and the fate of humanity. So, you know, not too bad for a Friday afternoon. Um, I don't want to be on a downer, but you know, we've got solutions, which is great. Um, one thing I guess I draw out of this is that We've learned from the last three months, particularly in New Zealand, how important it can be to listen to science. And it's unequivocal what happened over the last three months in New Zealand was of enormous mutual benefit to us as a, as a population led by good science. And so we've got really good science in, in other fields, not the least being climate. And so <clears throat> when people that are usually relatively reserved in their declarations and in, in their prioritizing make statements that are that powerful it really is beholden on us to listen and to keep on doing what we can so their recommendations were number one replace fossil fuels with renewables and then there's a series of other ones we're not going to dwell on those really today but certainly number one in our sites can be the replacement of fossil fuels with re renewables. And there's a background image of the same day at the other end of our country with severe drought. Um, so it, it's not a, um, a disparate or an un unimpacting um, set of events that's going on here. This is really affecting us now here. Um, I think this image is amazing in Australia with uh, a bushfire plan flood. And just a few days ago, Christina Figueres from the head, or well, the head of the United Nations Climate Change Response Unit, said that the 10 years we thought we had around this addressing climate issue has basically been shrunk to three to 18 months. 
Now that's pretty sobering, and that's because of the formula at the top of this slide, which is COVID-19 plus climate crisis. We've got billions and billions of dollars being invested globally and, and in New Zealand in what's going to be happening <clears throat> to help kickstart economies, to rebuild social networks and, um, and business and the fabric really of society. It's been so deeply challenged in the last four months. And how we allocate those and what decisions we make and what we do about it, which we're all part of. And especially, you know, there's a number of attendees here from government, from ECA. It's great to see you guys here because we have the opportunity now. And I'm not that old and I hope to see a really positive change in my lifetime. And I've got children who are much younger. And if we don't make those changes, they're going to be seeing some pretty gnarly sites in their lifetimes that I'd rather that none of us have to go through. So what are the responses? At a government level, we've got the climate change response, zero carbon amendment bill, <laughs> which is just, let's call it zero carbon, just to make it simple. And that's reducing net emissions of all other than agricultural greenhouse gases to zero by 2050. Now, zero 2050, I think those are words that we really need to dwell on, or numbers. 30 years to get to zero. I've been alive more than 30 years, and most of you probably too, and it doesn't feel like a huge amount of time. There is a degree of urgency here. So we're going to be establishing a series of mission budgets as stepping stones. Those are our, our triennial um, plans, so there'll be 10 of those. And climate change adaptation measures, that's more about coping with the images that we've seen previously. So a $200 million decarbonisation budget was announced for the state sector. Wonderful. And a $5 million Ministry of Education Sustainability Contestable Fund. Now, I'll highlight the next round is at the end of this month, or toward, sorry, in th less than three weeks' time now, two weeks' time. Um, and that's a fantastic opportunity specifically for schools to do positive change in this sphere. And on an industry level, just have a look at this from a broader perspective. What the New Zealand Green Building Council did is they've written a roadmap for zero carbon buildings in Aotearoa. So if we say a zero carbon building, we mean one that doesn't have a negative environmental impact, is helping to mitigate against the climate crisis and is taking us forward in, in a sustainable way. So what did they say? To ensure zero carbon buildings in Aotearoa, the government must include restricting fossil fuel combustion. Here we go. We're in it again. So it's fossil fuels, renewables are replacing fossil fuels in new buildings by 26. Now, it's only six years from now. And eliminating use in new buildings through 2030, through building code. Now, there's a big review going on at the moment. And I don't think it's um, a surprise to anybody that we are now seeing really significant action by government on these processes. So we had just today the announcement that all new housing New Zealand homes, or sorry, um, kind of order housings would be built under Homestar 6. That means the whole baseline's just moved straight up. Because if I go and buy a spec home from a, from a builder and they can't provide me with a house that's as good as a kind of order home and I'm paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for it, I'm not going to be very happy. So it won't be very long until till um, Homestar 6 is the baseline. And then, well, we don't all spend all our days in home and our kids don't spend all their days in their home either. So they're going to be in spending time in the schools. So if we just look at a life cycle carbon of a building, 70% of it's released during the occupation of it. And so we're looking at how can we reduce that? It's cutting out combustion of fossil fuels. And we could say these are hair shirt ray wearing, you know, nincompoops that really don't know what they're talking about and that are on the fringes of society if we want to be negative. Except when we look at who's funding this work. Argosy, Baileys, Precinct, Rizine, Warren and Marnie. Now, just Argosy and Precinct, two of the biggest property holders in the country. Billion dollars, billions and billions of dollars of portfolio. Not quite as big as the New Zealand government. So the government and the Crown Estate and one of the largest parts of the Crown Estate, the school network, has got the opportunity to help and to participate in delivering on this. 
And so also at student level, we've had school strikes for climate action, and it's a really significant international movement. Three and a half percent of the total population in New Zealand protested over this last September. And that's been acknowledged by the ministry. Good on them. The Sustainability Contestable Fund stated unequivocally, these projects highlight affirmative action and can decrease climate change anxiety among students. It's, it's serious and it's happening. So the Contestable Fund says that we can do replacement in non-renewable energy sources and reduce energy usage, reduce CO2 emissions, reduce energy use in general and energy resilience. So they specifically state diesel, coal or gas boiler replacement and replacement of inefficient heating systems. Round two, I'll just put that in there again, 22nd of June to the 3rd of August. This is an opportunity for change now. So what other reasons might we wanna upgrade the heating? Well, the picture in the bottom right is something that unfortunately too many property managers at schools have had to put up with for the last century. Um, we're a bit past that now, so we should be moving on. But we can also have problems with low classroom temperatures and the property manager should be understandably concerned about manual handling of coal and coal dusk, emphysema and an aging boiler. There's less budget available for everybody now and we're trying to do more with less. And so if it's taking a couple of hours a day or, or even a few hours a week of stoking coal into a boiler, is that really the best use of a school property manager's time and the budget available? School sizing, school sizes change. I got an inquiry earlier today, um, and um, we um, we have a couple of questions with uh, why the classrooms aren't warming up, and that will be um, often an aging system that just needs a bit of TLC and the replacement with potentially a, a slightly bigger boiler um, if the if the school change sizes changed. Schools, new schools are being constructed. If they're not constructed using sustainability principles, there's something seriously wrong in our system here. There's a concern about local air quality, and so there should be. And often um, with a resource consent lapsing, the current boiler doesn't meet improved air quality. So it shouldn't necessarily just be the driver that, oh, it has to be changed because our resource consent is lapsing and we're not meeting air quality. Air quality stands are there for a reason because we don't need and want to be poisoning each other and certainly not the smallest and youngest members of our community. So let's remove them now. So how do we remove them? We remove them with biomass boilers is, is certainly one really viable option. It's what we're gonna explore more now. Um, central heating of schools, and they can use any kind of heat distribution system. So radiators, air handlers, or underfloor. Underfloor is really only limited to new schools, and maybe it's not that suitable in, in most schools or, or most environments, but there might be certain rooms or, or certain vulnerable populations that that would really benefit. There are two main renewable biomass fuel sources in New Zealand that would be used on a commercial scale, such as in a school, um, wood pellets and wood chip. They're quite different fuels and quite different technologies in the boiler, the fuel delivery, storage and handling systems, and the availability of the fuel and the water quant content. That doesn't mean that one is necessarily specifically better than the other, but I'm going to look at wood pellets today because in the time that we've got, that's all we can really look at. And there should be others that are expert at dealing with wood chip and can explore that as well. So wood pellet fuel, they're a practical, low carbon fuel. They are 100% renewable. In New Zealand, they're manufactured from waste wood. That's really important to understand. There's, there's a bit of um, chatter going on, let's say internationally, Michael Moore did a film and um, there was a bit of concern about how biomass is done in the States with a lot of virgin material, let's say. So you know, forests being felled or, or crops being grown on otherwise productive land. In New Zealand, that's not the case. It's made out of sawdust. So the only other places that the weight, that the, 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 the feedstock, let's call it, that the origin of the fuel can go would be landfill or incineration, both basically wasting that resource as a fuel. There's over 100,000 tonnes manufactured in New Zealand every year. We've got existing distribution throughout both islands. There's no problems with availability of supply in any locations in the country. That's a really important point to emphasise. Bulk deliveries, which would be what would be done at a school, they don't require any manual handling. 
they're either going to be blown in through a vacuum truck or they're going to be augered in or, or um, sorry, elevator trucked in. They, they, there's, they don't require someone shoveling the stuff or carrying sacks of, of pellets around. From a cost management point of view, there are multi-year bulk fuel price contracts available. And from my discussions with suppliers, we're not a pellet fuel supplier ourselves. We supply the technology for burning them. But with the fuel pellet suppliers, uh, Nature's Flame and Aswood, they actually prefer multi-year contracts. And I'd like to see anyone in the gas or other fossil fuel industry that will give you a guaranteed multi-year fuel contract. I just don't think it exists because there's too much uncertainty about what's happening with fossil fuels. So how much does it cost? So if we're talking about a five to eight ton delivery every time, which is a, a pretty standard amount for a school to receive, we're down at seven cents a kilowatt hour. That's a really, really significantly competitive price. And carbon dioxide emissions per kilowatt hour of 0.003. So how does that stack up against other technologies and other fuel sources? If we just look here, I'll get my old uh, whizzy pen out. Uh, so the base case of wood pellets, we saw it's 0.003. That's because the carbon embedded in the wood pellet, the, the, the carbon which gives us the energy, because at the end of the day, carbon is a carbohydrate. It's what, pardon me, we burn and oxidize to give energy. And the carbon in wood fuel has already been spoken for, let's say it's already been accounted for by the felling of the tree and the process of it into lumber. So the only impact in terms of a carbon intensity of wood pellets is the processing and the transportation of that fuel. So it's extraordinarily low. And, and in my discussions with the, um, some of the manufacturers, that might even drop further because, for example, Nature's Flame, who are the main manufacturer in, um, or the only, the main, sorry, main manufacturer in the North Island, they are now using waste geothermal heat energy. And so, it's going to become less carbon intensive, which is really exciting. We're, we're blessed. We're fundamentally blessed with this resource. If we just look at a heat pump, now a heat pump uses electricity. I've factored for the uh, efficiency of a heat pump. If we're just talking about a high wall heat pump you know, on the wall, compressor on the outside, generally what a school's going to have um, if they're going to have heat pumps, it's 13 times more carbon intensive than pellet boilers. So even though we've got an 80% renewable grid, because there's still quite a bit of coal and gas being burnt and there's quite a bit of loss in the lines, it's 13 times more carbon intensive than a pellet boiler. And that's not to account for the global warming potential of the refrigerant, which if that leaks is many thousands of times more intense than carbon dioxide. But we won't get into that, but it's just something that, that, that should be on the periphery and certainly in the, the serious environmental management sphere of commercial buildings and, and others they're looking very seriously at refrigerants as uh, a global warming impacting gas um, if they leak out. So if we just move on to natural gas, it's 70 times more carbon dense than pellets. LPG 77 times because you've got more transport infrastructure in moving it around. A diesel boiler is 110 times. Coal is back around at 77. Now coal is a bit of a difficult one because there's lots of different types of coal different energy densities, different carbon intensity, but as an average, about, about 70, 80% worse than wood pellets. That's not to mention the sulfur dioxide, the nitrogen dioxide, the particulate matter that really impacts on air quality. Now, I've just got to turn my lightsaber off to carry on. All right. Am I back? Yep. So, oh, just highlight that. So cost-wise, it must be more expensive. Otherwise, we'd all be using it. Ah, oh, hang on. It's maybe 9% more expensive than a heat pump. That's a very difficult number to define because a heat pump has an efficiency curve and that's based very much on outside temperature. So as the temperature drops, so does the efficiency and ergo energy use increases and cost increases. Because we're talking about kilowatt hours of heat. We're not just talking about the cost of the electricity that goes into the unit. We're talking about actually delivered heat. Um, even natural gas is only about 10% less. Now, these are based on the MB commercial data figures. So you might be paying more for your gas or you might be paying less, but very unlikely be paying less than, than five cents a kilowatt hour. So 
it's only a 10% margin of difference. That's not particularly uh, a huge marginal cost when we're talking about 70 times less carbon dioxide. LPG diesel, forget about it. It's expensive and it's polluting. I mean, would we really? Coal, it's cheap. That's the only thing going for it. So it's probably really difficult to deal with, I guess. And um, that's why we're not using it at the moment. But we don't have to do any manual handling at delivery. This is a truck with a vacuum hose. You can just see it going into a big silo. That would be for a very large scale user of heat energy. So the silos are full of pellets, but the truck is still the same kind of truck that will come to a school. And the hose is the same hose that will be attached to the outside of the plant room and, and then just blow it in. So we're not shoveling it. It's not going to explode or self combust as other fuels may do, ergo LPG. If you've ever seen the the requirements around uh, both LPG and, and to a certain extent diesel. Diesel is more of an issue around spillage to the environment. But LPG, you know, if you've got a couple of a couple of hundred liters of LPG sitting on the edge of the school, you've got a very very large and significant bomb, and so that needs to be have blast walls around it, and it needs to be very carefully managed and, and dealt with. And yeah, it's incredibly unlikely it's going to explode. But if it does, the consequences are unbelievably horrific. And so we manage that by having blast walls. Well, why go down the track of something that is potentially so dangerous when there are alternatives that are not? There's local air quality concerns, primarily with coal, for because um, it knocks your socks off and it makes particulates come out. Uh, they don't have fuel fire safety requirements. If I went, um, my daughter's school, um, thankfully has got a pellet boiler, which is wonderful. We're just particularly lucky in this area. Um, if I went in and threw a lit match into the pile of pellets, nothing would happen. It would smolder out. So they can be installed in basements without external walls where gas boilers are now excluded under the building code. And it avoids a high global warming potential of refrigerants that we talked, that touched on a moment ago. And so you get um, a automated or not automated sorry a, 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 um, a non-manual handling delivery and then once it's in the fuel hopper it's an automated uh, mechanical feed into the boiler as well so you're not there shoveling the stuff into the into the day hopper so around the country we've got national distribution this kind of illustrates the four manufacturers and the coverage they've got the two big ones really, um, so the light green is Nature's Flaming based in Tolpool, and then we've got Aswood who are based in Nelson, and then there's a couple of others in Dargville in Vicargill. But we've got a guarantee of fuel supply. This isn't something where you put a pellet boiler in and you think, oh no, you know, I've made this huge investment, and but now I, I can't actually fulfill the fuel that I need for it. No, it's fine, it's all good. And actually output doubled last year of pellets. So this isn't uh, an industry in decline. And pellet fuels being included as an essential service under the COVID-19 restriction. So even under level four, there was still full manufacturing and delivery. So then if the fuel so good and easy to use and it's environmentally sustainable and friendly and it's relatively uh, cheap and affordable to run, it must be because the boilers are rubbish and are untried and untested and can't be used very easily. So let's have a look at that. They've been in use since the 90s, internationally and to a certain extent here. They're standard off-the-shelf products. They're very efficient. The boilers go from 95 up to 104% because they have condensing modes nowadays. So you can actually get over 100% efficiency with a condensation um, of the returning water. Uh, sorry, anyway, the condensing mode. <laughs> we won't get into the technicalities of it, but it's... Uh, over 100% efficiency in certain situations. They're highly automated. In this one, let me get my lightsaber out. Uh, in this one, you can see, so this is a 64 kilowatt pelomatic boiler. Up here is a vacuum. The pellets are sucked in and dropped from the, um, uh, the, the hopper into what's called the day hopper. So this just provides it with a few hours worth of running. And then there's an auger which sucks them again and or directs them through here. There's a, another auger. So, that, you know, there's a fair bit of machinery going on here, but they're very well developed systems. And then it feeds it underneath. So you've got almost a volcano effect. And then air is being forced in here as well. There's a fan which is pushing primary and secondary air into the combustion chamber. And then it's roaring away at a few hundred degrees. 
getting very good, very thorough combustion. And then you can just about see there's some red um, to blue to red lines around here. This is a water jacket. And then there's some spring, so it cleans itself. It, it kind of gives itself a little shiver and a little shimmy every now and again to clean off any particulates that might have built up on the walls. And the ash drops in the bottom. Another auger pulls the ash out, so you're not having to get in here and you know, scrape it with a hearth brush. No, no, it's all, all sweet. It'll do it itself. The ash gets pulled into an ash can here which you pick up and put on your garden for fertilizer because it's 100% organic fertilizer um, is the ash that comes out of it. Pretty cool. They're reliable and safe. There's hundreds of thousands in use globally. So just the company that we work with um, from Austria, Erkofen, they have 85,000 in use around the world. And then we also in this country have ETA pellet boilers. We have Haugasner. We have um, Froling. And so between them, there, there will be hundreds of thousands, possibly uh, over a million boilers. So this is a very, very well developed, very established technology. This is not, this is not an old nag that you're hoping to put an outside bet on. There's about 22 schools, in, is my understanding, with uh, specific dedicated um, pellet boilers in them. And then there'd be more with um, at, at least twice that, probably more like um, maybe three times that, that have got coal boilers converted to use wood pellets. Um, but we just need to be quite clear about that. And if anyone's had an experience in that aspect, a dedicated wood pellet boiler is a quite a different beast from a conversion of a coal boiler. So just to give you a, an idea of how it could look potentially in a, in, a, in a school environment, you've got a bulk store of pellets here, which is sucked through a vacuum hose into the boiler and as we saw it just drops in the top and then um, the flue gases off they go and, and what you don't see here is the distribution. So pellet boiler plus vacuum feed plus fuel store equals happy days. So there's no daily or weekly intervention in these running well, automatic fuel feed, automatic deashing. we saw how that works in the, the vacuum and the augers and then the augering out. It's going to free up the property manager's time. You don't have to be involved with this every day, not even every week. There'd be remote monitoring and settings, and I think that's really crucial. So people like myself and other who are expert in this can go and interrogate what's going on with the boiler. If the school has an issue, well, let's just get online, use the smarts of modern technology, connect to the boiler, see what's happened and is happening modify settings and then we can speak to the property manager in a very informed way and say okay well blah -de blah needs to happen or we need to send out a service person or oh actually we've resolved it all just through some settings on the controller we get notifications about when it needs to be serviced and when i say we i'm talking about as a distributor but that can equally be the property manager that could be the principal that could be your um a, a property advisor whoever you want it to be it could be your mum a fuel reordering notification email as above. And there is the capacity to fulfill every school size's heating requirements. That's an important point to note. There shouldn't need to be a limitation on which schools we can do this in based on the size of their heating load. There might be a physical limitation based on the size of the school and the space available. But then on the other hand, as the heating load increases, so does the school size and i'll show you ways that we can really fit it into almost any place so if we just have a quick look at central heating of schools in an existing school we've already got a fully depreciated system so the radiators the pipe work the primary pumps the control mechanism they might need some main, minor maintenance that's correct but it's there the bones are fully in place and can be utilized for building a better um, body on top. It's a centralized system and we can have centralized control so that makes it easy to operate and we can have consistency across the school and we can also have good control over fuel consumption and therefore fuel cost. I know something that's often happened when you have a distributed system and that's most um, uh, highlighted when you have distributed heat pumps, you know, they can end up being left on all day, all night, all weekend, all, all, all the time. I went to a school once um, and they had a six and a half thousand dollar bill for the last month's electricity. And we had a good look around and the heat pumps were all on 30 degrees and they're all on 24 hours a day. Um, 
and because the, the, it just wasn't fundamentally the right system, but also it wasn't being managed as well as it could be. So if you have a centralized system and centralized control, we can make those decisions in a well-informed way. You can also, though, drill down and have individual room temperature control with thermostatic radiator valves. So it doesn't have to be that if Mrs. Blake in room one, who's closest to the boiler, um, but actually doesn't want it as hot as Mrs. Turner in room 17, which is furthest in the boiler, that can be managed through the thermostatic radiator valves. And radiators provide a really comfortable warmth for people. Anyone who's ever spent much time in Europe or, or the UK um, or even might have central heating in your own home, which is unusual, but it's a really comfortable warmth. It's not a uh, hot and cold, uh, lots of air movement. It's, it's a warmth that we actually program to accept because it's the same warmth that the sun provides. And so all the solid objects and surfaces in the room get heated. And so you get a very stable temperature and the doors are always open in, in classrooms. And so we need to work on heating systems that can maximize the comfort levels, even with lots of air changes. You don't get very much noise from them or air movement and they can be flexibly located. Um, and you can use fan units if you want for larger spaces or if you really need, for some reason with the room design, you need it out the way in the ceiling. Well, you can have a, a fan mount system, uh, sorry, ceiling mount fan, just like you have a, a, for a heat pump, but instead of the water flowing through the um, fan system as being heated by a heat pump, it's heated by a boiler. So if we look at heat pumps, quite possibly a bit of the elephant in the room because it's something that a lot of schools have, have, have experimented with at least or, or used. And what I'd like to, to encourage you to consider is that they're additional and complementary to a central heating system. Because there is an increasing issue, especially as temperatures change, we're finding that more schools are, are wanting summer cooling. So, excuse me. If you need summer cooling, you're going to only be able to provide that through a heat pump. But if you use a heat pump only for summer cooling, you're avoiding a whole heap of issues. So the complementary system can actually really uh, hit its straps. So you're avoiding low temperature problems of winter heating because a heat pump is extracting energy from the air. And so as the air temperature drops, there's less energy available. It's able to do less heating fundamentally. Then we're also um, halving our running time. And so you get a much longer lifespan. A heat pump's compressor's lifespan is based on how many hours it runs. So if you're only using it for a restricted time in the summer, you've just ex massively extended the lifespan of those heat pumps. And to get the longest possible lifespan from a heat pump, we would encourage them to be removed from the preventative maintenance replacement schedule in a property plan. My understanding is that if you have a heating system in there that could possibly fail, it's put in for a preventive maintenance, pardon me, preventive maintenance replacement because it's an essential building service. But if it's for summer cooling only, that's not essential. It, it, it's important and we'd like to have it, but it's not essential. The school can open without cooling. And so, you can take that heat pump right to the end of its actual life, not replacing it prior to it functioning or not. And so again, you get more value, you get a longer lifespan, and you don't have a such bad depreciation index. Um, they do work best if the classroom's closed up. So we would encourage their avoidance, except during hottest times, because as you close a classroom, the CO2 levels raise, uh, and we get less healthy air for the kids inside. So if we just have a look, this is a lot of numbers. You can always look at this presentation later, but I just wanted to give you some indicatives on what we think we might be looking at for this um, system. And so I've taken the SPG average classroom sizes for primary, intermediate and secondary and composites, which, which is a bit more of a range. And then an average number of, let me just go get my magic wand, um, an average school size. And again, th this is high level indicative stuff. This isn't going to give the answer for your school um, in Wainui Omata, for example, but it's going to provide a reasonable guide for what could be going on nationally. And then a heating load based on North and South Island heat load requirements that so being pretty conservative, uh, like generous, let's say, um, because schools generally don't have the most wonderful infrastructure and um, insulation properties. And so that gives us an indication of the heating. So the number of classrooms, 
and then administrative uh, room equivalent classrooms. So, so four equivalent additional classrooms for, for all the other rooms there and eight, etc. And then that's simply multiplied by the by the, the heat load per classroom. So we start getting some indicative numbers. And then crucially, can we do this, for example, with the pelomatic boilers that we distribute and there are obviously others? Um, oh, look, I only need two in the average primary school. I might need five in the intermediate school and I might need seven in secondary school or up to four in a composite school. So it's totally practical and doable and boilers are constantly stacked in, in numbers. I, I don't want you to be freaked out. Oh my God, seven boilers, ah, that's, that's loads. It's exactly the same with fossil fuel boilers. They just stack them. It's an efficient and effective way of doing it. So there we go, and that highlights it. Um, so if we look at the practicalities of it, again, more numbers, but I've just brought through here the um, number of boilers for, for each school category, and then what kind of plant room space. Now, again, this is broad brush. We'd need to look at specific individual design, but it's not beyond the realms of possibility because we've now got, even in the biggest school, a secondary school with seven boilers, big heat load, we need about 14 square meters. So, you know, say a, a, a seven by two meter, or no, you don't have seven by two, but I just call it a seven by three meter plant room if, if we could have that. Plus we need another seven meters of, so 21 meters. So what, a four by five meter plant room dedicated to this system. We probably need a little bit more, but just to give you an idea, it's, it's not moonbeams. Um, we're certainly significantly less even than, than a classroom at this stage. And we likely to refuel it twice per term, or we could have more pellet storage and it could just be once per term. So it's not like a truck's gonna be turning up every week delivering pellets. School heating loads are not that great. It's not a factory that's churning out a huge amount of meat and needs to be washed down with boiling hot water every day. This is just a school with a bit of heating to do. So in a primary school, we're talking about only storing about five ton of fuel and only needing to be refueled once a term. It could be after three o'clock, it could be after the kids are there. I'd encourage it to happen while the kids are there and make a scene of it and have it as an educational resource. But however you want to manage the school and this in impact on it, it's not significant. Once to twice a term and store more, you don't have to have deliveries as often. So this is just based on averages again and a, a pelomatic 64 kilowatt boilers. So seems reasonably practical. So it must be heaps of work for the kit, uh, for the uh, school property manager to deal with. But again, emptying the ash box on the gardens. So the ash that comes out of a pellet boiler is a certified organic fertilizer. It's great for the roses, high potash. And I would anticipate because you've got larger schools and therefore more boilers, the workload is essentially shared between each boiler. So in a secondary school with seven boilers, each boiler would still only need its ash emptied once or twice a term. So that's picking up the box, taking it outside, making it an educational outcome as well, please. It'd be great to do this, to demonstrate the practical outcome of all the things happening and taking it around to the school gardens and spreading it on as a fertilizer. And then the property manager would also need to vacuum inside the boiler once a term. And then you need to get a professional service once a year. Hopefully that's manageable. So if we can't fit it in the plant room, what other options do we have? And so the energy box containerized pellet boilers comes into a, a pretty good space here. It's all the components for a pellet boiler system in a container. We've got the plant room that's containerized, the fuel storage. This is just an example, by the way. Automatic fuel supply to the boilers, the pellet boiler or boilers themselves water and power connections to the school, the flues, it's all there. You then get a really high level of cost control and standardization across the country. So if there's anyone here from the ministry, oh, sorry, all the people here from the ministry, I should say, and from ECA, if you want to be able to deliver guaranteed carbon savings at guaranteed cost, then this type of standardization is a really good way of approaching it. And it also means that across the school portfolio, you're not having to have 55, well, not 55, 2,000 different ways that, that, uh, that the cat's been strung up. This is a 
way of having um, consistency. And so that's in the design and delivery, and then of course down the track in terms of its servicing, its maintenance, and its operation. So we can have guarantees of workmanship as well, of course. I mean, that's going to come without saying. And flexible site placement. So as long as it can be plugged in somewhere to the school network, I mean, it would make the most sense to have it near the existing plant room, but yeah, it can be moved around a bit. You can trench some cabling and pipe under it and have it over in another place and put a bike rack next to it. They're modular, they're relocatable, they're expandable. So if the school needs change or the school itself changes, pick it up and put it on another school. Sweet as, done. So here's an example that where it's blended in with the surrounding buildings. That's a 40 foot energy box with a containerized pellet boiler plant room. And that's um, in Austria. So it's designed in a way that blends in with its surroundings. Or joyfully celebrate the potential for it to be used as an engaging and educational display of what that school is doing. Um, cut truth windows in the side so people can see the pellets. Let's, we, we've got educational resources that we've developed under the physical world curriculum so that people can, or well not people, our students can really feel strongly proud of what we're doing rather than hiding away the dirty secret in a dirty old plant room with a dirty big flu attached to it. So there's a just picture of someone hanging out with his with the their pellet boiler with the the buffer tank behind them, the boiler, and the pellet store. So that's all in a 20 foot shipping container, and that would be enough to do many small primary schools around the country. And you get larger ones. So this has got four boilers in it. It's got a couple of fuel supplies. Now these are just demonstrations. We can arrange them however we want and however we need, depending on the, the circumstances and what we're looking to do for that site. So if we think about practicalities, a primary school might need two pellet boilers. And so that could be in one 20 foot container and it needs 15 square meters. So that's 2.4 meters wide by six meters deep. So it's approximately, I don't know, one and a half car parks, maybe two car parks, or it's a bit of grass on the edge of the grounds that doesn't need to be mown anymore, a little bit of waste area, or if there's a plant room that's absolutely full of asbestos and contaminated with coal dust, just bowl it. Don't worry about reusing it, just flatten it and concrete pad and on the container goes. Or keep the plant room, clean it up, and you can use it as storage. There's lots of different ways of approaching it. And so in an intermediate school, we might have two 20 foot containers or 140. Now we can stack containers because they arrive on ships that go around the sea with plenty of you know, earthquakes in a sea where the ship's tossing around. We can certainly put containers on top of each other and as they've done in the casual mall with no problem. So they've got less ground footprint or we can go up to two 40 foot containers. They could be side by side, they could be end to end, they could be stacked on top of each other. So the possibilities are really flexible. So to give you an example, we're doing Netherton School up in the Waikato. It's a full primary school with about 130, 140 students in a rural location. There's about 800 square meters of classroom. They're replacing the aging coal boiler, corroded pipes and asbestos chimney. We're providing them with one pellet boiler, a five ton pellet store and a thousand liter buffer in the plant room. And that will have a fully automated automated pellet feed de-ashing so freeing up the time and it's being funded under that fund that i may have mentioned before the sustainability contestable fund round two opens 22nd of june guys from the ministry of education and we're going to be installing it in the july school holidays so we will get some take up for this year and we'll get a good idea of what's going on no camera um so then there's another one that I can't quite um, talk about the name and location at the moment, but put it this way, it's a small, about 200 student secondary school in a cold location with a long heating season, quite unpredictable weather with often very cold periods. And it's got a very distressed coal boiler that's really at the end of its life and thrown a towel in. But the plant room, as we'll often find in schools, is small and awkward. And there's really limited space and, and the changeover. I mean, I think actually what's in there at the moment is going to have to be chopped into pieces to try and get it out.
because there's been in building of attached school buildings. So it's really, you know, it's, it's, it's crushed in there as it is, let alone trying to put new things in. And so the solution is a complete review of the heat load in the school. And we're finding that the coal boiler is well oversized, which is often the case because of the way that fossil fuels were done. And back in the 19 God knows what, 30s, 40s, 50s, when a lot of these were installed, it was a case of more is better, bigger is better. And we've since evolved our thinking as a species a little bit more and evolved the technology. So it doesn't have to just be big is best. And so we're proposing an energy box containerized pellet boiler solution with either three or four 64 kilowatt boilers. We're just finalizing the design based on the heating uh, monitoring that's going on currently on a, um, a backup system. It might even drop as low as two boilers. And that's a really, a really, really critical part of this whole game is that if we can reduce what we're putting in in terms of plant, then we're going to reduce the overall cost and we're going to make the whole system more efficient and really make the whole budget sing. So where to from here? I suggest that you get in touch with us or other pellet system designers and distributors to discuss your requirements of the school and the schools that you're working with and on and start a collaborative design process. We can help to forecast the change in fuel cost and your property manager's time available will increase and so for your 5YA profiling. Um, discussing a new system with school property advisor is a really important part of them going to apply for the second round of that sustainable contestable funds that opens in two weeks. And also alongside, I'd encourage you and Ika's listening here at the moment, I understand, we should be exploring the improvement of thermal performance in the school buildings. So in parallel, the insulation, the radiator types and numbers, thermostatic controls, those are all fundamental to improving the overall sustainability performance and fuel consumption ergo cost to the school. So there we go. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Brian. Hopefully that was helpful. Questions? Hello. So we've got Thanks very some... much, Sorry. Marcus. And I'm now going to pass this over to uh, discussion. And as I've said earlier, if you like to put your hand up, <clears throat> then I will give you preference to a person who has their hand up and wants to put the question yourself. Um, if you want me to uh, put your question to uh, Marcus, then I will do that. I have a, a number here already. Um, but uh, I uh, am very keen to have uh, people talking themselves and, uh, and, and putting your own question rather than me interpreting uh, what it is that you were uh, wanting to, to say. So to start that though, is that I will start um, the, a couple of the questions. Uh, one from Ruth Thomas, uh, any funds available for tertiary organisations? I'm not the best person to answer that question, I'm afraid, Ruth. Sorry to bounce you, but um, I would look at the Contestable Sustainability Fund uh, and the Sustainability Contestable Fund and, and see um, how they can help you. Brian, there's quite a lot of people with their hands up. Can can we go to any of those? Uh, okay, I'm not... I can manage it if you want. Uh... Okay, I've got no one with their hands up. All so, right, Alexis Dykeman, I'm going to unmute you. So, hello, can you help with your question, please? Oh, I, I didn't have a, a question. Oh, okay, sorry, I've got your hand up. Uh, maybe Janine Appleby? Hi, um, yeah, I've actually just typed in my question. I realised today wasn't, um, I didn't realise there was a difference between pellets and chips, okay. but what, what is the fundamental difference between the two? So, really good question. Um, essentially, wood chip, if we just start with those, are made out of larger chunks of wood that are basically sliced or, you know, I think the word is hogged, but I'm not an expert on this, but it, it's made into um, chunks, essentially, chips, um, which are of a reasonably consistent size. And also what they're aiming for is a reasonably consistent amount of moisture in, in those chips. So the, the dimensions of them are quite important and the moisture content becomes important. But essentially you're taking 
big bits of wood or, or medium sized bits of wood and chopping it into small pieces that can then be fed into a, a boiler. And the boiler itself is, is quite a different beast because it's dealing with chunks. And although, I mean, fundamentally the technology is relatively similar, the, the, the fuel supply method is, it can be quite different and how you store the fuel and also the, uh, the spread from where you can get the fuel. A uh, wood chip is about, a, uh, I think, around a third or maybe a half at the very most of the energy density of pellets. So that means that you don't get as much heat energy out of the same weight and volume. And so you really don't want to be transporting it very far. My understanding is there's about a 100 kilometer radius is, is usually about the, the, the sort of fundamental uh, difference. And then wood pellets are made out of waste sawdust and wood shavings and they're literally they're also needing to be dried though and so that is a a, a guaranteed moisture content of i think eight percent or less and they're extruded in in a very high pressure system so you get a very very uniform size of, of pellet and it, it looks more like a, a chicken food whereas wood chip just looks like yeah, you know, the same stuff you get in a playground, say, uh, as the as the, the kind of the, that bedding mulch under the swings. Um, wood pellets looks more like chicken food, and it's uh, much higher energy density for weight. That that, that, that's helpful. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, right. really helpful. The fuel supply is the critical oh. difference because wood chip you need to be close to your fuel origin to make it economic and also sustainable. Otherwise, you just burn heaps of diesel trying to move the stuff around. Whereas wood pellets uh, are generally in a centralised plant and then distributed around the country. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but Marcus, I'll, I'll, I'll invite uh, Rob Mallinson. He, he's had a lot of experience in both of them. Rob, are you, are you uh, could you answer uh, that a little bit more in terms of uh, pellets, Chip? Are you there, Rob? I'll just unmute him. There you go, Rob. Yep. Yeah, I am. Hi, hi, Marcus. Um, my company's called Living Energy. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but we did the first six schools in New Zealand. Um, on to, got them onto wood energy in 2009. Um, right. They all had to be going on the very first day so, uh, of the winter. So uh, it was quite an interesting challenge to have New Zealand's first six wood chip boilers all going on uh, the same day, starting up. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I would, I would corroborate what you're saying. And, and generally, that was under a, a scheme, again, funded by the government, and it was called the Renewable Heating for Schools program. And um, and the idea was that the country learned from those experiences. And I would say that um, although we did chips for the first uh, series, that um, was driven by various factors, mainly budget um, and not having, and uh, we were converting coal, uh, all the schools we were converting for were from coal. So there was, a ready-made fuel store of sorts, although it's, uh, it's obviously not ideal, as you say, in terms of energy density. Um, but yeah, I would generally say, my, I would recommend, if you can, go to pellets for schools um, because of the convenience, the uh, homogeneity of the pellets. Um, we did line up um, six separate fuel supply contracts for wood chip, and obviously they're all quite problematic in terms of size. Uh, there wasn't much incentive for the chip supplier to get into the business at that time to supply 20 tonnes a year, or, or I think the, the biggest one was 100 tonnes a year at Dunstan uh, High School. So, um, yeah, I'd say for schools, um, pellets are a really good solution. Um, and low maintenance as well, that's a key factor, and will lead to a higher uh, reliability because of the consistency of the fuel and the less maintenance required. Um, when you move up to hospitals and things like that, I think at that point, um, wood chip becomes uh, more justifiable and, you yeah. know, and it becomes a, a horses for courses. Yeah. So okay. thanks, Brian. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. Rob. Okay, I will invite uh, Ian McKenzie. I've just unmuted you, Ian. Um, to Thanks. Put your Marcus, I'm interested in the comparison between a conversion of a coal boiler with a delicated wood pellet boiler. The uh, difference in efficiency. How would you make the choice? Okay. Um, oh, okay. There's quite a few factors here. So if we just look at efficiency, it it it'd be quite difficult to say what the efficiency is of that coal boiler at the end. I mean, you could do some monitoring of uh, wood pellets in versus heat out 
but you, you couldn't exactly define ex you know, where it's at, certainly in advance. And so, whereas a, a wood pellet boiler, you would say, okay, look, it's got this benched tested efficiency and that's what it's going to have because you're kind of taking out the packet and putting it there. Um, the other aspect to, to deal with is um, the reliability and the, the sort of technical side of it. And there's a fair bit going on to change a wood, uh, sorry, a coal boiler to burn pellets and it's got to be done really well. And also it's got to be maintained really well. So there's a significant difference in the, the longer term um, maintenance requirements between a conversion of a coal boiler than a made to measure pellet boiler. The, the key is that the combustion process of coal and wood pellets is, is actually very different. Um, coal's a lot more forgiving, should we say, um, than wood pellets. Um, and so you've got to essentially tune a coal boiler um, even after its modification to burn pellets and you've got to keep it tuned. So you need someone who's very expert in what they're doing, spending a good few hours every quite possibly term, um, but certainly year, tuning that boiler. And I don't know if most schools are either up for that or also maybe necessarily doing it. And so what we've unfortunately seen is that people don't always have the best experience as a school with the, the conversion after maybe two or three years, you know, staff changes, uh, the, 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 the excitement of the new and, and the focus from the company maybe converted it, maybe they're doing something else or the funding's changed. Certainly there was some ECA funding available initially and, and then that, that changed over. Um, and Scion were doing a lot of it in the past and aren't now. Um, so so you know, the world changes, moves on. And so then a converted coal boiler burning pellets that was maybe perfectly tuned and working very well three or four years ago is now not really doing so well. And that will be exhibited in it just not being as reliable. So there's more intervention by the, um, by the staff there. And there's maybe uh, not quite as reliable heat coming out. And so people get pissed off and then they're like, oh, well, these pellets are rubbish. I'm not going to carry on with this. I'm just going to change it for a heat pump, push the button, it goes. And that's fundamentally a problem if we then judge the technology across the sphere. And so, yes, a conversion is appropriate if that boiler can be well converted and then well maintained. That's crucial. But um, if we're just going to be doing a conversion and then hoping to walk away, or um, that's not appropriate, that, that is replacement territory. So does, does that help explain the differences? Oh, it certainly does. You'd have to feed the maintenance properly into the equation if you were making that comparison. Exactly. Now, I do support the other things you've said about the thermal uh, capacity of the school. The other things need to be done as well, whether it's conversion or a dedicated boiler. You need to put on the thermostats, et cetera, and yeah. hopefully try and uh, train staff to actually understand what's happening. Thank yeah, you. no worries. Thanks. Right, I'd like to invite uh, Julian uh, Dunn to um, add to that. Uh, Julian, you've done a few uh, conversions. Would you like to make some, add some comments to that? How about a music, Julian? <laughs> Are you there, Julian? He may not be there. Maybe we should ask this. Right. Other, some other questions. Okay. Then. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, we've got Grant Dunford. I've uh, unmuted you. Is there, Grant? Oh, hi. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mark. It's really interesting. Well, Mark, sorry. It's really interesting um, delivery of all sorts of issues <laughs> that we're facing. Sure. My particular issue is that I've, I've got a friend who um, we put in a, a boiler system for their home and swimming pool and their home is comprised of um, solid concrete walls internally and externally. Um, so a radiator system was put in using a boiler that is now 16, 16 years old and they can't get a, um, a new ignition system for it. So they're looking at what alternatives they had. One of them they suggested was um, a, pellet, a pellet boiler. And I'm just wondering what where, how appropriate you think that might or think that might be for a, 
a home system. Mm. Um, it sounds ideal. Probably best if you just take my details from that page that you can see now and get in yep. touch with me. Um, and yeah, we can work it out, no problem. Yep. And the other question I had was um, whether it could be suitable as a central heating system component in a um, self contained and sustainable um, residential development. Well, yeah, I mean, like a, 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 any heat load that is required can be delivered by pellet boiler systems. So they go from the smallest, you know, a, a 10 kilowatt output would be the smallest system available, um, right up to men, multi megawatt um, systems. So it, there really is no limitation on what can be done. It's just a matter of motivation and finances. Yep. Okay. Thank you for that. No worries. Yeah, get in touch. Right. Well, I will. Thanks, Grant. Um, we'll go to uh, Tim Jones. Um, you, you've asked a question very early on. Uh, do you uh, uh, want to add to, uh, to that? I've uh, unmuted you uh, if you'd like to speak. Um, yeah. Thanks, Brian. You hear me out there, Marcus? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Yeah, thanks, Marcus. So as a non-technical person, somebody who's trying to encourage uh, schools to consider making this change and, um, and encourage parents and students to think about this, one of the biggest questions I, I often get is, but wouldn't solar be better? Why don't we just put on solar? Sometimes people will add, you know, why don't we have solar and batteries? Now, in your presentation, you looked at grid electricity and the emissions factors related to that and heat pumps. In your view, where does solar fit in? And if somebody said to you, well, you know, actually I'd rather go to solar, what might you say to them? Yeah, okay. So no cool, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, fundamentally it comes down to looking at some numbers and, and I think this is really important to, to do and to, to allow people to work through the process. If we looked at how much heat energy needs to go into a school and we just normalize it to, to kilowatt hours, so that's a, a measure of, of, of energy, and then look at what is even available, even if, 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 if you had all of the energy from the sun absorbed directly by the school in some magical process that meant that it could be transferred immediately into heat energy that warmed the school you wouldn't even have enough available, certainly not at four o'clock or five o'clock in the morning when a school needs to start being heated in a winter day to provide even a tiny proportion of that heating. It's physically impossible. So then when you go through a naturally inefficient te te technology like PV, which converts about 15 to 18% of the sunlight that hits it into electricity, you then got 15 or 18% of the, of the available energy. And don't forget that a, a school needs to be warm when the kids arrive. You know, we're really blessed in New Zealand. We, we have a, a climate that moves a lot during the day. And so we want it warm at six or seven o'clock in the morning so that when they come to school and the teacher's there and everyone's starting the day, it's warm. If you needed to wait until the sun was up and actually shining in an intense way, which doesn't really happen until 11 o'clock or so in the day, especially in winter, you're going to have an absolutely freezing cold school. And the reason that we're able to only heat usually uh, in most locations until about midday is because the sun is then up. And most of the time, the coldest temperatures that we experience in New Zealand are when we have clear skies. And that's when you have a clear sunny day the next day. So you will get some warmth into the school from the sun, but trying to do it through batteries, it, it you know, it, it, it'd be a similar way of, of, of you saying that um, I would like to cook my dinner by putting it out in a well insulated box with a, a, a piece of glass over it. You know, such things like solar cookers do exist, but you'd really struggle to do that at night and also in winter. So it's all about when do you need the energy, how much energy do you need, and where is it available from? And I guess a, a really good point of comparison is that bioenergy, wood pellets, are just stored solar energy. 
there's your battery, it's the tree. And your collection method is the leaves. And we're keeping it all in current account carbon. So we're not mining fossilized sunlight, which is coal, gas, and oil. That's just sunlight as well, but it's been fossilized for a few million years. And if we're using bioenergy, we've got a solar panel, which is a, a leaf, and, we're, and we've got a battery, which is a tree. So there, that's how you can use the solar energy to heat the school. Great metaphor. Thanks, Marcus. All good. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Uh, right. I've unmuted Gary Wilson. Gary. Hi, Brian. Haven't spoken to you in a while either. Anyway, uh, my question is about the efficiency um, or the costs you stated. Are the costs per kilowatt hour in your little chart for the fuel only, or do they include the um, efficiencies, um, combustion and, and heat transfer efficiencies? Uh, they don't include con uh, uh, heat transfer efficiency because I would assume that that's a, 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 a static, d whatever system you're using. And it would be enormously variable as well, almost impossible for me to try and factor that. But it does include combustion losses. So the boilers are operating at about 95, 90 to 95% efficiency. And so that's been factored into the cost of the fuel and the carbon emissions. Yeah, as compared to a coal boiler, something less than that. Yeah, well, that, that, that slide that had all of the, the comparisons. Uh, comparisons. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. this one wherever it is, oh, it's way back. Um, but yeah, and that was assuming a non-condensing boiler, so this one, um, because yes. when you've got a radiator system, you're unlikely to be able to use the condensing mode because the return water is going to be too hot. I'm so thanks. Okay. Who else? Okay. Right. I've got a question uh, from Dave Dobbin uh, about the noise. What is the uh, noise level? Um, on this equipment and decibels? Uh, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head how many decibels it is, but um, uh, the, the the plant, like, well, let me, how can I explain this? So, yes, there is some noise in the plant room, but for example, my children's school has got a pellet boiler um, in the plant room. And I can't tell if it's on or off if I'm outside the plant room. So um, it's not something you're going to have in the corner of a classroom. And even if I'm standing outside the plant room, I can't tell if it's on except by going inside. So I don't see it as being something that we need to, to, to kind of consider. And then radiators, um, if you've got water running through the pipework that if there's no air you shouldn't you can't actually hear water moving you might have a very tiny tinkling sound occasionally as the metal expands as it warms um, but say compared to if we if we look at what the other option is which is a high wall heat pump there are a number of tens of decibels um, in order to move air around because they they've essentially got a fan inside them and, and they're blowing air around the room so um, you could definitely tell if a heat pump's on in the room because you can hear it. Um, whereas the boiler's out somewhere over there in a plant room, which you generally wouldn't be able to hear. Hey, Dave. Okay. Um, the next question is from Chris Rowe. Um, could Marcus confirm the flow and return water temperatures that work best for these boilers? So the boiler itself controls the flow and return temperature um, so that it doesn't form any condensate inside the boiler and you don't get any creosoting on the, the, the heat exchanging sides. Um, let's have a quick look at the boiler. Um, and that would, so, so in here, you, you've got basically a big water jacket that surrounds the combustion chamber. And we don't want those surfaces to be cold for very long at all after it first lights, because you, can, you could get the buildup of creosote on the inside if it's below 55 degrees. So it maintains the, the water in that jacket above 55, or generally it'd be 60 or more. And it does that in the Urkofen uh, by recirculating internally <coughs> and by other boilers, it, it, it sends it out and then brings it back mixed with, with uh, less cold water. Um, and then as we go around the heating system in the school, we'll be usually heating those radiators in the mid 60s so that they're not so hot that you, you, know, you, you get any kind of scold problem from touching them, but they've still got plenty of heat radiating out. 
and then um, you know the water will return at the beginning at, at ambient temperature, and then it's going to slowly build up to, until it gets to to more like um, 50 degrees or so, um, 55 or 60, and, and then it will stabilize. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jenny Campbell has put her hand up. I've unmuted you, Jenny. Sure, uh, thank sure. you, um, Kira Marcus. Um, I'm, I come from Mossburn and we've got a pellet boiler here. And um, one of the biggest uh, improvements was for the principal who had to be out there because little country schools don't have the luxury of a caretaker or the fancy word that you call. The <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm trying to avoid the word caretaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so the principal was, you know, had to go early to school and remove the ashes and all that kind of thing. And it's compromising the health of the children and the staff that have to do that work. And I wondered if you have background information when you're telling people about the benefits of pellet or chip boilers, about the health impacts on the children that are at schools, and there's been quite a few studies done. Do you, you know, help people realise the significance of what they're actually doing to the children that are at school? And there's been some recent studies published regarding the link with um, people's lungs being compromised by air quality and being more vulnerable to um, to being infected by COVID-19 and things like that. Do you sort of alert them to health issues? So do you mean the improvement by removing the cold water? Yes. Um, yes. I, I think it'd be a really important part of um, the curriculum materials. Yeah, I agree. Um, I don't know if that would come under the physical world curriculum component. I'm not an education specialist, but certainly the people that we're working with that are developing those curriculum materials, I would highlight that and, and get them to then do a bit of background research and, and incorporate that. So our approach is that we do training with the staff on site um, at the time of changeover. And ideally, you know, I would prefer to involve the, the pupils as much as possible. Um, mm -hmm. It's obviously going to be led by the, the school staff and, and it has to be decided on how they want to handle it. But yeah, agreed. It's it's a really important issue. And I think it, it's hopefully it would help with the um, urgency, let's say. So I was I, I didn't dwell very much on the health side of it, but certainly mm -hmm. know, that combined with climate crisis means that we have some mm -hmm. urgent changes that we can and should make. Right. And related to all of that, what I, I may have missed this, but have you got a life expectancy okay. average for once you've installed the pellet boiler? Yeah, good question. Sorry, I didn't include that. Um, about 25 years, we'd expect, from a um, one of these modern pellet, po pellet boilers. Mm -hmm. And what's the largest size industry or business that you've actually, um, you know, changed all of their heating system to pellet boilers if you got a you know just sort of tell me was it a freezing works or a university or brian's probably best to answer this you you've got much more broad experience across the country than i have brian okay um either jonathan or scott may correct me but i think the biggest pellet boiler in uh new zealand is the uh the military army camp in wairua which is 15 megawatts uh, of heat um i think that's the biggest one and uh, but the, in terms of, of uh, limits, there is actually no limits. Um, in, the, in the UK, uh, this major power station, Drax, uh, is using wood pellets uh, for its uh, um, projection of electricity. So uh, size is not a, a, an issue for pellets. Um, it uh, is can do from the very small to the very large. Mm -hmm. So it would be the availability of the pellets and delivery and, you know, within a certain radius and that that makes it economic. It's more that kind of thing as it you'd be considering. Yes, yeah, so the, the, there's, there's the, both the economic, both and, the economic. The, and the non-monetary benefits that, uh, for any of these projects. And uh, uh, each one needs to be evaluated in its own case. Uh, but it's looking up those benefits. You raised the one of uh, air quality. That's one of the non-monetary benefits that's often ignored. And mm -hmm. uh, as one of the, the benefits of moving from uh, an old coal boiler to uh, any of the um, uh, biomass boilers, which will generally be much uh, better, uh, as you said, for the children's health uh, than uh, the existing coal boilers that may be continuing. But on the other hand, is that uh, there's also an economic decision the business has to make in terms of, of converting. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, and especially true for hospitals where people go there to be cured and actually breathing in the fumes from the boiler as they go on the front door. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for answering all my questions. Thanks for the good question. Yeah, so, um, you know, Hill Morton Hospital in Christchurch is on pallets. Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, both Otago and Canterbury are moving towards wood fuel um, compared to, to uh, coal and uh, which fuel they use in terms of pellets or um, uh, chip will come, will come out uh, through the process, but uh, uh, both of them are, are equally as available, both of them are available, and uh, it, it really, you've got to look at the total picture and uh, make the decision of uh, why you would do one or the other, um, and it uh, is, a, is a total uh, analysis of the uh, monetary and non-monetary benefits uh, according to location, etc. Now, Catherine right, I've, is on the line. Catherine Chang, I've uh, unmuted you. Catherine. Uh, hi, Brian. Thank you. Hello, Marcus. Hello. Um, my question is um, about the supply of sawdust for wood pellet. I, I assume there must be plenty at the moment. Um, but I'm wondering if, if we manage to change all New Zealand schools that are on fossil fuels for heating at the moment uh, to wood pellets, would, would, would we need to have more plantation of pine can to I, have more yeah. sawdust, or is there plenty to go on for a long time? Can I defer to Scott Fairburn? Is that okay, Brian, if I open him up? Scott, are you all right? Yes. Oh, Scott just disappeared. Um, is okay. the chap here from uh, I, I can answer that generally is that um, there's uh, should be no concern about the availability of any biomass fuel um, whether it's pellets or even chip um, is that the market like any market is evolving and the availability of biomass um, supply uh, meets demand and uh, there's capacity in the existing pellet uh, producers to make more uh, and uh, they could increase capacity themselves. The sources of biomass, uh, we've also got a lot of ranges. At the moment we're only touching the easily got uh, plantation forestry. We haven't even moved into some of the other ones and we certainly haven't even uh, maximised the availability of biomass from agriculture. Yeah, so you can make pellets out of other materials than just sawdust, um, Brian says. So you can make it out of crop residues and, and all sorts of different things. So, yeah, as long as we have sun and soil and water, there is the opportunity for biomass fuel. Okay, you, I've uh, uh, unmuted uh, Bex Hudson Lowe. Uh, you've got your hand up. Yes, hi. Um, sorry, I missed a little bit because I had to go and do school pickup. So I apologise for if I <laughs> have enough questions. Um, we, our school is intermediate in uh, Marsden, and I'm just looking at options because we're doing this uh, school hall upgrade. Yep. And we're planning for heating and cooling. So you touched on um, that you probably need both heat pumps for summer cooling. Um, but is there a distribution for the wire wrapper for the pallets at yes. this stage? Can we get the pallets? We can. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I just, um, I mean, in the North Island, it's it's nature's flame. And um, I did a couple of quotes uh, for schools recently, and um, they were about uh, <laughs> seven cents a kilowatt hour delivered. Um, thank you. And um if we just do the hall upgrade at this stage can we add to the rest of the school with putting more boilers on once the heat pumps reach the end of their lifespan um yeah we would look at it sort of site by site you, you you wouldn't generally put it just for the hall um but it, it could be something that uh was installed and expanded it, it it's generally a centralized system I mean, do, do you have um radiators in the rest of the school at the moment then and, a, and some kind of boiler system somewhere? The old boiler's been um, disestablished. They're going to rip it out to make it a PE shed. Okay. Um, and that was a coal, burning, a, co a coal burning yeah. boiler. So um, you'd still have yeah. the radiators, presumably, in the school then? Um, 
for years, I'm not 100% sure, but at the moment there's heat pumps being installed in most of the teaching spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we definitely need something for the hall. Yeah. Well, in the yeah. short let me if, if you don't mind i'll get in touch with you bex because it, it is site by site but that is the nice thing about having um the, the type of approach that we make and that that it's a modular one so if you said okay well we've got a hall requirement now and so we would locate say a, a container um because you don't have a plant room anymore with enough to heat that but with the forward planning that okay in eight years time when all the heat pumps fail we're going to need to replace all of those as well and, and add those to the network. And then at that point, the school can put another one, two, have many boilers in the container. So it's not capitalized up front, but everything's been considered in that way. Then, then that would be a really um, appropriate way of approaching it. Yeah, sounds good. So sorry, I must, did you say how much it was roughly for a boiler? Um, the cost? I No, I haven't. Uh, so just to give you an idea. Uh, I mean, I don't know how big your school hall is, but a, oh, where's this? Yeah, so um, a single 64 kilowatt boiler is about $45,000 plus GST. Now that's just for the boiler. You're probably up at about 60 um, by the time that, the, the you know we've got a containerized system um but then you know the costs are varying depending on what the setup is in the hall um but put it this way the netherton school system that we've just done oh sorry we're, we're just about to do um that one it, we're having to rip out all of the old asbestos contaminated yuckness from the coal boiler and and yeah th there's quite a bit of remediation work to do um there's quite a lot of damaged pipe and that came in at around $100,000 um, for, for, for the whole school. Um, but, but that doesn't include the radiators and things. So, yeah, it's not moonbeams, but it, it's not, you know, a few hundred dollars either. No. Okay. And is there a consultant that can come and look at the school and things oh, like that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure there will be. And, and there's us as well. And, you know, we'd encourage you to look around and, and yeah, speak to people you're comfortable with and also there'll be people who have been working on the mechanical services in the school already and they may have um you know in consultation with someone like us or, or others may have the capacity to, to to do that work as well so that it's kind of we divide it up the speciality of pellet boilers is, is really just the boiler and the fuel and and that side of it and then the rest of it just the, the distribution of the hot water and the radiators and things that's very standard mechanical services it's just the boilers a little bit more unusual and that people aren't quite used to them yet because we've relied on fossil fuels so okay. the rest of it's all very straightforward and once we know how much heat the heat the hall needs that can all be worked out in a very easy and straightforward normal way by any mechanical services contractor Okay, no, great. I'll definitely if I can get in touch after. Cool. This All right, thanks. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Thanks. Okay, um, I've unmuted Scott uh, Fairburn uh, from uh, Nature's Flame for the next question. Um, uh, but if he's not there, Jonathan, I'll pass to you. Um, I've got a question from Dominic Willister. Uh, how much does seasonal demand vary for pallets? Uh, thanks, Brian. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Yes. Um, yeah, it's Scott from Nature's Flame here. Um, to and covering off the earlier point around um, demand and, and those kind of things. At the moment, New Zealand's a net exporter of wood pellets. Um, Nature's Flame exports, uh, as wood does a little bit as well, both for domestic and commercial use. Uh, both, well, all the companies in New Zealand, I'm sure, would much rather sell to New Zealand companies. So there is capacity in the market, and it does also make it. Um, uh, the, the density and the energy within pallets makes it economic to to, to move around uh, New Zealand. So we personally have customers from Auckland to Invercargill, um, and as would have them distributed over New Zealand as well, which is fantastic. Um, and as far as the sawdust goes, there's plenty of sawdust. Uh, we're based in Taupo, as would based in Nelson, and the other two, Waipapa and Niagara, are based on the back of sawmills uh, in Northland and Southland respectively. So there's lots of uh, opportunities um, for more sawdust 
and as part of the government commitment to a billion trees and also domestic uh, processing of logs and bits and pieces, the, the waste that's left over uh, is forecasted to grow. So um, that's that's no problem at all. But basically, um, yeah, there's capacity with wood pellets significantly. Uh, we sell domestically in 15 kg bags for home heating um, and then uh, in one ton bags and trucks and containers and whatever format you'd like, we can sell it to you. Uh, across the country, so none of that's a problem. Okay, thanks, uh, Scott. Um, yeah. Now, uh, I've got two more questions and then we'll close off. Um, so we'll go to Angela and then uh, uh, Marcus, can you have a look at the uh, written question yeah. from Boyd Manon? Uh, and we'll finish with that one. Uh, so Angela uh, Ogier uh, has asked, how do wood pallet burners deal with particulate emissions? Kia ora, Angela. Um, so they have very high combustion efficiency and therefore, um, plus, plus the fuel itself is very dry. And as uh, Scott said, it's very consistent in terms of its manufacture. So both Nature's Flame and um, uh, uh, Aswood are ISO certified manufacturers. And so that's quite important because what goes into the pellet is going to be essentially what comes out when we set it on fire. And so that fuel um, performance um, helps to manage any particulate matter and then the combustion process. So the all the boilers that are available in New Zealand are um, really good at managing the combustion process. So the amount of fuel in and the air in and the forced uh, ventilation out. And so you get very full combustion of the of the product and very very low particulate matter um, and if you have a look on the ECAN website then you've got the ultra low efficiency burners and, and there's actually a category for pellet boilers and so that the, they're meeting the requirements for the the highest you know, standards in the country through ECAN. Does that answer the question Angela? Yeah, okay, that'll be fine. Uh, now, last question uh, from Boise Menon. Um, I, I think the best way to handle that long question is if you interpret the question and, and, and answer at the same time. So, Bijoy asks about how the rooms are heated. So, essentially, um, the boiler is setting fire to the pellets, and then, oh, maybe this is a good example. Where's, where's that one? Um, and so coming out of the, the, the boiler is hot water. So that's then, it, uh, this one shows it a bit. Um, so at the top of the, this boiler, you can see two pipes and then a, a hot and cold, th well, a, a two round circles on each side, a, a blue and a red. So the hot water will be leaving the boiler, circulated around the school in this example and, and you know, fill up radiators with, um, with the heat and then return and, and, and be reheated some more. So the distribution of the heat is just through water um, in, in pipe work and then in radiators. Um, and flu gas tube. So yeah, you can recover some heat from the flu if you have a condensing boiler, but that only works if, if your returning water is below 55 degrees. And um, I think I covered the emissions a second ago, um, and the exhaust just goes out through uh, a flue from the top of the boiler, so um, just like a, a chimney would. And the, the the size of it is is very much dictated by the output of the boiler and the height of it by the nearby building. So what do we need to clear? But it's got a very similar emission profile to, to gas, maybe very very slightly higher particulate matter. But apart from that, the flue gases are very similar to gas boilers. Uh, okay, right. Um, I'm going to pull this webinar to a, an end. We've um, gone uh, way over our um, uh, three o'clock deadline, but I've let that go because of the nature of the questions and uh, the whole point of uh, these webinars is for uh, discussion and information dissemination uh, and, and discussion. So the, uh, I think the aspect of where we uh, have covered here is very relevant not only for the schools but for other commercial applications uh, and uh, uh, I welcome 
uh, either any further questions to uh, myself or directly to Marcus uh, or to any of the other members of the sector who are very active at the moment in doing this. A uh, number of people have spoken today. Um, follow up with any of those. If you want an uh, introduction, uh, we can provide that. So it's great to have a great turnout uh, for this topic, 122 registrations. And uh, I think that uh, it reflects that uh, the importance uh, and the actions that people are taking today to uh, transition from using fossil fuels to a low carbon fuels. Uh, we've presented uh, one of the options today, uh, touched a little bit on the wood chip one uh, and onto the comparisons with heat pumps and uh, solar. Um, but it's really a matter of horses for courses over which one. Um, and we are putting the information out on the biomass ones. Uh, we're not uh, putting the information out on the other ones, but uh, it really, it's as Marcus said at the beginning, it's incumbent on us all to uh, transition away from the fossil fuels uh, that uh, are currently um, used uh, extensively and unnecessarily. If you are not a member of the association, I certainly welcome you to a number of consultants uh, who are here uh, in particular. Um, you know, we want to be able to have a stronger association. We can do more of this. Uh, we can uh, promote uh, the, the sector a lot more. And most importantly though, is interact with those people who are facing the decisions of what to do with the heating, whether it's a school, at home, or in a commercial application. So I'm gonna pull this to an end now, and thank you all very much for attending. And in particular, I'd like to thank Marcus for putting this presentation together uh, and um, providing the information, which obviously has generated uh, a lot of discussion, and uh, that's the uh, sign of a good uh, webinar. So thank you very much, Marcus. Cool. Uh, so thank you all for attending, and uh, uh, we will be putting on um, more webinars uh, along these topics. Uh, so be, keep in touch with us, and uh, we we're certainly welcome if you have um, something that you would like discussed, or if you've got something that you would like to present on, uh, I'm certainly interested in hearing from you. So thank you all, and goodbye.